All right. So yeah, I mean, when I was watching like videos on YouTube and watching digital nomads live their life in different countries, um, it's more specifically Asian countries. And, you know, they see like the rent is very low. And even though the rent is very low, it's still like some of these luxury apartments, they're still extremely, extremely small because the Asian culture is just, you know, uh, you know, more of a tight niche area compared to like the American where they, they need more space, right? Yeah, my place here is uh, just uh, like a, it's a one bedroom, but as like a detached kitchen. Um, I, but on average, I spend like four or $500 a month on rent, which is just mm-hmm. nothing compared to the United States. And it's normally pretty nice places. But have you gotten used to it? Because when I watch those videos, like, wow, it is a really tight space. But then again, when you go to these countries, most of your activities like outside your apartment, right? I mean, my, mine's not too bad. I mean, I have like a, it's a one, it's a, it's like a studio, but a lot of the, like, I'll just move my camera. They have like this glass sliding door a lot of times. So it like mm-hmm. closes off your bedroom. So it's not like a detached bedroom, but it's just, I don't know. It's like a, it kind of is a bedroom, but not really. That's really common in Thailand. So mm-hmm. I stay at places like this. So I don't, I don't really mind. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because in, in general, Asia, there's the population so much larger than here in the U.S. So you could have more space here, obviously, you know. Yeah, so, definitely. So you are a digital marketer and you have multiple businesses, obviously, going around the world and working on your businesses. Um, now, what was like the first business or, you know, better, let's put it this way. Did you always have the notion or the idea of being like a digital nomad or did it just come about? Sure. So flashback to when I kind of fell into this, I had no interest in travel and no interest in business whatsoever, um, which is kind of funny. And I didn't have an interest in travel until I'd already had success in business. Um, And the way I got into it is back around 2015 is when I started. I was in high school then. Um, I'm 20 now. So I started when I was 15 in business and I applied for a few jobs and really just didn't like the whole idea of getting a job. And I did end up getting jobs after that anyway, while building my businesses, but I didn't like the idea of getting a job at that point. So I started building like themed Instagram accounts, mainly just to like see if I can get followers and show off to friends. Um, but also to see if I can make a bit of money, like selling shout outs. So I, you know, I followed a lot of pages and I saw people promoting different things and they must be getting paid for that. So that's kind of how I got into business. I built themed, built themed Instagram accounts. Like I had a luxury car one, a travel one, um, a makeup one, like not necessarily like my personal interest, just like mm-hmm. things I knew I could build. And um, after like six months, I had about 500,000 followers between a few pages and started making money. And after about a year, I had around a million followers and I was making a decent amount of money and eventually ended up selling those Instagram accounts. Um, when I saw Instagram's natural um, reach start to go down a bit which has been the trend where, you know, now mm-hmm. TikTok is all the rave because Instagram, you get shown to like 3% of your audience, it seems like. Yeah. So you got started when Instagram was, you know, the organic reach was really yeah. as good as TikTok maybe during that time. Yeah, I was, yeah. I mean, I was gaining thousands of followers a day using good hashtag strategies, posting regularly, shout out for shout out, just like organic methods. Mm-hmm. So you had multiple pages and did you just use multiple pages to see which one would like stick? You just threw a million things at the wall and see what would stick. And then from there, try to monetize that. Yeah. So I I wanted to try a bunch of different niches and see which ones would grow. But quite honestly, it was just the fact that like, it was so easy back then. Like I would make a hashtag set. I would just take pictures from other accounts that were similar. Like none of the content was even unique. It was just like everybody reposted each other's content. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just, it was pretty easy. Like I could manage like 10 pages of like an hour and a half, two hours a day. So it was just like, why not make more pages? I mean, I made so many Instagram pages, but like you can only make so many Instagram pages per phone till they block your IP. Um, so I like maxed out my phone, my mom's phone, my dad's phone, and even some of my friend's phones making Instagram accounts. So how did your day look like? Uh, literally just making content and just reposting stuff on your, all your accounts? Not, not even so much as making content, but just taking it from our pages. Like I'm sure you've seen like the luxury pages that are kind of trendy. Well, they've been around forever mm-hmm. where people just literally have re- been reposting the same pictures oh, for yeah. five years. So it was honestly not even like being creative, just like being 
I don't know, consistent and aggressive with growing the pages. And back then it was really simple. And the way I would like, I would spend most of my time just not even with the content, um, just going for, like through a hashtag, like hashtag, like I would just choose like men's accessories, for example, and sending a direct message to like every men's accessories brand I could find saying, hey, do you want to buy a shout out? Do you want to buy a shout out? And back then I wasn't like even entrepreneurial, I would say. I was just making money. I, like I was like, didn't have an interest in business too much. I like started gaining my interest in business back when I was doing that. So I didn't have like a well-crafted message. Like now I have beautiful cold emails I sent out from agency. But back then it was just like spamming people. Do you want to buy a shout out? Do you want to buy a shout out? And surprisingly people said yes. It's kind of crazy. I think Instagram, I mean, the first social media uh, platform that I used was uh, MySpace and then Facebook, then Instagram. But as far as I can remember, Instagram is like the only social media platform where it became like an actual place to do business in from what I remember. And it's just crazy that this business model of creating pages, meme pages, whatever, growing an audience, selling shout outs, you know, doing affiliate marketing. Uh, it's just crazy. Like the new business dynamic that Instagram has brought. And I was totally naive to that. And after hearing like stories like yours and other people doing it, it's like crazy. And it definitely, it can be challenging. You know, it, it, it just can't be as easy all oh, creating a, a page and watching it grow to 500,000 followers, 1 million followers. I mean, in some cases that could be the, that could be the case, but um, I feel like you definitely know, you need to know what you're doing, what type of content you need to produce, um, especially down the line. But if you're the first person to do it, then I guess it is easier if you have that yeah. first mover's advantage. Yeah, right now, I mean, I don't even, buy, I, this is a business model I've been out of now for four years. Um, this is just how I got into entrepreneurship. Like right now, growing organically, I like, so I, I, I mean, I run a marketing agency. I don't even suggest my clients grow organically on Instagram. I mean, it's just the, the amount of energy that goes into like doing that, you're better off spending that money on ads. Mm -hmm. so, during, so that was like your first taste of entrepreneurship. And sure. that was your, your bread and butter, right? That was it. the income coming in as an entrepreneur, your first taste. Yeah, that's, that's the first time I made money. And when I sold all of my Instagram accounts, I didn't make like a ton of money. Um, but for a 16 year old who never had like a job uh, before that and never had money before that, you know, it was thousands of dollars, um, which was, was like a good start. And um, not being naive, I went ahead and used that money to start like 10 businesses at the same time, which uh, all failed because you can't start 10 businesses at the same time. I mean, since, since I started entrepreneurship, I would estimate I've started around 20 to 25 businesses. Most of them have failed. Um, be, especially because I started so many at the same time when I first like sold that as Instagram accounts and lost a lot of that money. Um, but where I finally picked up some traction was I started doing marketing for people because you know, people would pay me to grow for Instagram accounts back when it was still possible to really have organic growth. Um, and I was making, you know, a few hundred dollars a month and a few thousand dollars a month. And uh, since then I've, you know, I've gotten exposure to so many different business models because of having a marketing agency. You know, I've had exposure to private labeling, to drop shipping, to uh, real estate, to proper brands. You know, I've had a, um, info credit businesses. I've had so much exposure to all these different businesses because I've helped out market them. Um, you know, since then I've, I've had a, a few successful businesses. I, my main one's my marketing agency now, which we do Facebook ads primarily. Um, but I also had like an e-commerce store last year that was doing quite well. Um, and currently I have my marketing agency and a couple other businesses, but those are a bit, are a bit different out of a marketing space. Yeah. Just going back to that, when you were 16 and you started 10 different businesses, um, that can be like both good and bad because the, the bad part is you fail and you kind of learn your lesson. Um, and the good thing is like you get that exposure, you know, yes, you, like you get that exposure of losing that money, but it sucks. But at the end of the day, you learn. And when you created your digital agency, digital marketing agency, was it something that was kind of like a, a passion or you just had a skill and you kind of want to monetize and leverage the skill that you obtain over uh, getting Instagram followers? Sure. So I would say, I wouldn't say it's a passion, but I enjoyed it a lot. And I still do enjoy it a lot. I would say my passion, my only real passion has become traveling, but at that point traveling still wasn't introduced to my life. So um, 
Yeah. So when I got my agency going, I um, needed to hire some people. So I, um, I started hiring freelancers and uh, kind of how I got into freelancers, how I got into traveling was from my freelancers. Like I ended up traveling initially to actually meet freelancers in person. Like I went to India to meet some of my actual like, freelancers working for my agency when I was 18. So that's kind of how I like, that's, I got the travel bug, like when I went to India and that's where I was like hooked on it. And like, now I've been to 20 UN countries, but if you count territories, I've been to like 28 countries. And okay. Well, how did your, your family like think about it? Like, are, are they, does your family like to travel a lot? My family is not entrepreneurial and they're not, they're, they like to travel, but they like, like a more American type travel, like okay. cruise, like going on cruises, traveling around the United States. Um, I would say the travel I like is a bit odd and we're not odd, but a bit more adventurous. So quite honestly, I don't know where I got it from. It's just something where I think I was heavily influenced maybe by like people I follow on YouTube and just like, cause I, I think if it like it wasn't for YouTube, I wouldn't like think travel was like so possible because like I didn't grow up in it. So I watched people on YouTube, like backpacking Europe or like going around Asia. And I'm like, oh, if I can do it, I can probably do it. Mm -hmm. So you just went to, you said India just to meet your- That's my first trip. Just to meet your, the freelancers that were working for you. So yeah, so I went there actually doing a bit of charity work, but also I tied in where I'd meet some of my freelancers. And I actually um, flew one of my freelancers from Bangladesh who was like, became one of my best friends from being a freelancer and like me and him specifically, we've actually uh, traveled together to through India, through Bangladesh and Vietnam. So it's kind of cool that like I hired someone on Upwork a year later, I met them. And since then we've become like best friends and traveled around together. Yeah. That can be like a, a BuzzFeed sort of story. Right? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I wrote an article on, on medium actually. I did get any traction on that. I think medium was still pretty popular, but what is it like in, back when uh, Instagram was growing. I know Medium's organic reach went down lately. I wrote it like a few months ago. I just write oh, on Medium okay. for fun. I mean, I have like a lifetime earnings on Medium of like $2. I just like to write on it for fun. That's like a hobby. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's, that's still pretty cool though. I mean, not many people do like spontaneous things like that. Uh, I think some people might just overthink it. I, and I, at 18, I don't think my parents would let me go to, like, uh, to India or any other country for that matter. But... So once you went to India, you caught the, the traveling bug, right? Yeah, yeah, and definitely. What was it exactly that kind of made you spark that interest? Like, oh, there's more than just the U.S. There's a whole different scene out here. I think two, two or three things. One, I just enjoyed it a lot more than I thought. And I was like way more comfortable than I thought because India, I would consider a more advanced country to visit. Um, it's not like... It, India is a more advanced country. So I figured if I'm comfortable and having fun in India where it's like complete chaos, quite honestly, then I'll be comfortable anywhere else. So one, I realized I can handle this. Um, two was that I, um, how do I put it? Like I, my priorities change. I was very like, I used to be like big into like hustle and like being busy is a good thing and like materialistic and having a big ego. And like travel is like killed that. Like I'm not very materialistic. I don't really want anything. Um, I, yeah, I don't have a big ego anymore. I, um, I think that being busy is a bad thing, not a good thing. And I don't really believe in hustle. So a lot of, it changed a lot of my personal beliefs. Um, and which, you know, opened up this extra time to explore our interests. So yeah, I think it, I think it was a few things. Um, also, I'm a bit obsessive. Like, that's a good, like, a lot of entrepreneurs are a bit obsessive. So, like, I was like, most people might say, oh, that was a cool trip, like a once in a lifetime thing. Like, I want that all the time. So, how can I make this happen, like, all yeah. the time? Like, so um, that's when I kind of like found out about the whole digital nomad thing. Like, oh, I can live this life constantly, not just on occasion. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to stay grounded in, in one spot. You're more of like a experiential sort of person, right? You're not yeah I, I i'm very much fueled by new experiences i get i don't i don't like complacency whatsoever i like to change things in my business i like to uh change the environment i'm working change like the hobbies i'm exploring i, I like new things mm -hmm. wait so you sold all your all your instagram pages and then you started your your digital media agency directly after 
So I started, sold all my Instagram pages and then I started a bunch of businesses, but didn't really work. And I, I started my marketing about right then, but it wasn't like very structured. I called it back then actually MG social marketing. My name is Michael Gardner. So it, mm-hmm. it, you know, first initials, not very creative. And I just kind of did that for fun. Um, and it took, got, took off a bit of traction, but when I really got serious about my agency, um, was about a year and three or four months ago where I met up with a couple of guys. I was working with my agency in person and we came up with the name Nomads of Solutions, came up with the website, came up with the logo. And that's when we like really got serious. Like 2019 was our uh, first six figure year of that business. Oh, damn. That was only, that's pretty recent, three or four months ago. I mean, when I think of digital nomads, like they, it's most, it's really important that, that their fuel is running. And what I mean by that is if, in order to have that lifestyle of traveling. And I know when you go to like foreign countries, like in Asia, um, the most expensive part is probably going to the actual country. Everything yeah. that everything else is like cheap, but you still need to have a source of income to, to fulfill your, your lifestyle there. Right. No matter how cheap it is. And I guess the most worrying thing is, okay, where's my money going to come from? And now you had this, you sold your Instagram pages for thousands of dollars and you know, that's not, that wasn't going to last forever. So you created all sure. these businesses, not everything worked, but at what point did you kind of have a reliable source of income and that gave you the ability to travel from one country to the next? So I've had consistent income for some part ever since like 2016. So I had consistent income for my Instagrams. After that, I didn't really have a business, but like a lot of random freelancing gigs. Okay. I did work some real jobs. So like I've had a really strong financial safety net. I would say. Um, but like, even though last year is my first six figure year of a year bef- before that, you know, I, I did well, it just wasn't six figures. Um, but it, you know, mm-hmm. I, I did, I did good. So uh, I started traveling in 2018 and, and by then I was like consistently making, I would say at least a thousand or a couple thousand a month in 2018 and 2019 is when, you know, things got to like five figure months. And, um, you know, this year, I, this month actually will probably be my first multi five figure month. Okay. So you were just, yeah, making enough or, you know, that's more than enough to, to live or travel to different places. Yeah. Um, so what was that inflection point then? So you went making thousand dollars a month and now you said you're making six figures once you met your, your two buddies, your two partners, like, sure. What was it exactly? Was there, what was there like a, an inflection point or was it just something that you focus, <laughs> focus, focus? Uh, I was doing like a, I mean, now I have a couple businesses, but one of them, I'm a passive owner, more of an investor. Another one, I'm more of an advisor, like nomads of solutions is like, for, it's pretty much my primary focus. I mean, I do some coaching and some stuff on the side and the two other businesses I'm involved with, I'm I have more of an advisor role. Um, but it's really my main focus. And we used to offer like, full service digital marketing agency, like everything. Now we are like pretty specific. We work with e-commerce companies for online and for local business, we work with home service businesses and we offer Facebook ads, Google ads, and occasionally social media management. So we went from like offering everything to everybody to like two main service offerings, sometimes social media management to two types of businesses. And another thing is consistency. Like we used to just kind of like randomly get clients from referrals or like networking in person sending Instagram DMs, but now we have like consistent client acquisition strategies. So we have like predictable meetings every week, new clients every month. Uh, it's just very predictable. And also like our client retention has gotten so much better. Like we, when we first started, you know, our client retention wasn't perfect because we, our services weren't perfect, but now we have like really good client retention. and Almost all of our clients are very happy. Yeah. Um, so you working with three or two other partners right now? For, oh, I have like two contractors. I met my contract okay. as a person. So I am the only owner, but uh, I have some very involved contractors who do this like full time. Okay. So you were, you weren't directly contacting or working with other digital nomads to help expand their business. You're, you're working with everyone, right? That you can, or do you have like a niche? Well, for my agency? Yeah. For my agency, we just work with e-commerce businesses. So like a lot of times Shopify businesses and we work for, that's for online business. Um, and for local businesses, we work with home service businesses. So I don't necessarily work with digital nomads. I just travel around. Okay. And what's like the most challenging thing besides, you know, the time differential, if you're working with someone who has an e-commerce business here in the U S. Um, 
in terms of running the agency or running it as a digital nomad? No, really just running the agency. Like, was it like the Facebook ads? I know there's a lot of variables running an agency. Um, sure. Like it can be like the customer acquisition, getting leads, Facebook ads, communication between yeah. you and the customer. Um, I don't, I don't know if there's any, like, I think consistency is the most difficult thing is like just being cons- like doing everything a little bit every day, you know, like consistency has been the most difficult part. And that's something I've really nailed down, especially uh, this and this year and late last year. Um, like, you know, doing the same amount of outreach every day, you know, um, checking in on ads every day, man- checking in my team every day, like just the consistency of it. Mm-hmm. Talking about focus, um, you know, today I was at the library and I was just working outside, right? And when I work outside, uh, I there's scenery, obviously, and you can get really distracted. Now, just imagine someone like a digital nomad like you uh, going to beautiful countries and, you know, working in a really beautiful area, be- really beautiful setting. I can only imagine that you can lose your focus almost <laughs> an instant, like in a second, right? Is it, was that the hardest part you think, or one of the hardest like things of like being focused and not being distracted by what's out there. Yeah, that's a good observation. I, that was definitely something I struggled with at first when I first started traveling. Um, when I first started traveling, I thought that I could go to like one country for one week, another country for five days, the next city for three days. Now I go places for like an average of one month. Like I'll go to this country for a month, that country for a month. Like in Thailand, I spent like three months in Phuket, one month in Chiang Mai, a month and a half in Bangkok. Um, like I, I travel a lot slower and when you travel slower, you have like more time to see what there is. So like, if you're there, if you're at a location for five days, you're like, Oh, I need to see everything. Cause when I leave, I might never come back. But if you're there for a month, you know, you have, you have longer period of time to see things. So I think traveling slow, um, not only is it more economical, but it's a lot more easy to focus. And also I have like strict, like times I work between, like I like today, I am working between 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and I stop at 4 p.m. and I won't be doing any work Saturday or Sunday. So like I have, you know, I I don't, I used to do like hustling, I guess, but I I really believe in work-life balance. So I have like very rigid separation between personal and business life. Mm -hmm. If you stay too long in a country there, it becomes a problem, right? Uh, It depends on the visa. Like for right now in Thailand, um, normally I would need a visa, but right now, because of a pandemic, they have given like visa amnesty to everybody here. So like I can stay in the country until the end of this month without a visa. So I've managed to stay here for like 150 some days or something without a visa, but normally I could only come here for 30 days at a time. And then you're kind of- Then you could get a, then you could pay for a visa. You could pay for a visa or you could like do what's called a visa run where you like fly to a neighbor country for like one hour and fly back and get a new 30 day. Um, it depends on the country. Like some countries you have to apply for a visa before you go. Some you can just show up and stay for 180 days. Some you can't go at all. So it just depends. And, and what country do you think was the most, um, that you had the best experiences in? Um, I would say, ha- well, it, it's, it depends on what you're looking for. I would say that the story I have the coolest stories from and like, I'll remember forever was probably be Bangladesh. However, I would never want to live there. And there's also a ton of problems there and it's like absolute chaos, but I love it at the same time. Like I have the most cool experiences from there, but I would never want to like be based from there working because it would be so difficult. Yeah. I, I have this one friend at work and he's from India. I forgot where exactly. And I, and we were talking about like car accidents, right? And <laughs> I was like, yeah, like, how do you, how do you deal with the car accident in India? And he's like, it's simple. You just argue, you know, it's just it organized chaos. And here in, in the United States, like you, you know, it's very structured, you know, you call the police, uh, take pictures of the insurances. But sure. in India, it's like, what already told me, it's like, if things go well, then you're going to have to, you know, throw your hands up and, and start fighting because <laughs> it's that, it's, it's just like that. Um, and he told me exactly what he told me that sometimes the, the Wi-Fi uh, goes on and off and you have to bribe the police to to basically turn that on and it's just absolute chaos and i can see why people can enjoy that you know um well the people having- are lovely that's what makes up for it like there's such a strong culture and the people honestly are so good overall 
Um, I mean, Bangladesh and India are very different. You have one's a Muslim country, one's a Hindu country. Um, and I, I've spent a good amount of time in both, but I would say I had the most interesting experiences in Bangladesh because like India is quite touristed. Like, I mean, it's an exotic location, but they have plenty of tourists. But Bangladesh has like virtually no tourists. Like Bangladesh has even less infrastructure in India, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of scary going to a country where they have like absolutely no, no tourists. Um, that can be like, well, you know, when you go to Thailand, they see a tourist. It's kind of like, oh, like this, another tourist. He's part uh, of the country. But if you go somewhere else that's really remote and they're not used to tourists, then that can be something that's more, uh, you know, something very different. You know, I have yeah. had a one hour line of people to touch my skin and take a picture of me. Really? Like I have been like, <laughs> I have been, I have been, I, that's not even a joke. I've had like, I've been the first white person. Some people have seen, cause like I go like my company, I have a company in Bangladesh. I have a BP over um, that some companies outsource to. And I, I, yeah, I, it's an area inside Bangladesh where like even Bengalis don't travel there. It's not bad or anything. It's just, even for Bengalis, they don't like go there. I don't know. It's like going to North Dakota of the United States. You just don't do it. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I've, a lot of people have just never seen a white person there before. So it was just like, whoa, what's that? You know? Um, and like, I have like my, the hair on my arms is like a lot different than theirs. And they're like, the kids find it fascinating. They want to like play with your arm hair and adults want to like take a picture with you. And it, it's kind of fun. You know, it can be a bit overwhelming, but if you're like a very relaxed person, um, it's really cool experience. So you're kind of like the man right there in that, that moment in time. Um, in Kona, Bangladesh, I am surprisingly well known because <laughs> I've spent so much time there. So whenever you, if you ever go back, then you probably uh, recognize you. Yeah, I've sure actually been back. Been. I've been there multiple yeah. times. So yeah, I am. Um, it's kind of funny. Like on my Facebook, I think like 75% of my friends are like Bengalis from Kona, Bangladesh. Sheesh. <laughs> so when you got there, it had to be a, a, a culture shock. I honestly, I'm pretty easygoing. So I wouldn't say I was like shocked. I think part of the reason is like, if it was like 10 years ago and I couldn't just like look up a YouTube video of where I was going, I might've been like, whoa. But I'd watched so many YouTube videos on um, where I was going, but I wasn't really surprised. I mean, it is a lot different. You like get out of the plane and like you can taste and see the, like pollution and but the crowds of people and it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot, it's a lot, the smells, the scenes. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't say I was like too shocked because I, I expected that. Mm-hmm. And in terms of like, you know, going to places, getting food, like in communicating with the locals, was that kind of like a challenge? So in Bangladesh, I had my, uh, my friend of me, my close friend of me. Um, but even then, like, you know, you can still use Uber, you can still like, use Uber Eats to order food. Everybody speaks at least a little bit of English. Like every country I've been to, people speak enough English to get by. Um, so with technology, it makes travel like so much more cheap. I mean, so much more easy. Like if you get completely lost, all you have to do is just like pop up a few bucks for an Uber back to your hotel or Airbnb. Yeah, I think, yeah, Uber is almost everywhere now. Yeah, Uber, if not Uber, then Grab. Yeah, okay, so is it after Bangladesh, where, where did you go again? Um, I mean, I've been to Bangladesh multiple times, but I, I've been to in Asia. Um, where have I been in Asia? I've been to Bangladesh, India, Singapore, Qatar, UAE, Vietnam, Thailand. I've been all over Thailand, and I've been quite. A, I've been around a bit of Europe as well. I um, I backpacked for Europe once, and I also lived in London for four months. And I traveled around Europe on like the weekends, just like close by countries. Right. What do you like better, like Asia, Europe? Like what's um, I mean, it's different. Like Asia is more exciting um, and it's a lot more affordable. So like I prefer to live there, um, but Europe, you have a better time zone and it's easier, I think. To, to run your business? Yeah. Easier to run your business, especially for time zone. The time zone makes a big difference. Oh yeah. I think in, from where I'm living, it's five hours, a five hour difference uh, between New York and, and, and London. Yeah, so, and we're so, so probably, manageable. I think we're 11 hours apart. Yeah. Now, do you just wake up one day and be like, you know what, I just want to go somewhere else. And, you know, the next day, the next week, you're just kind of just gone. Mm, I actually pre-plan quite a bit. 
Um, I actually do pre-plan a bit because I like to get good deals on Airbnbs and like they get booked up if you do it last minute. Um, but currently right now it is so hard to go anywhere. Like, um, so I can't be spontaneous. Like I've actually been trying to go to Turkey for a while, but every flight I get gets canceled. So I'm just like coming home for a while just to, um, wait until things get more stable. Mm-hmm. What's like the most, what do you think is like the most exotic country or maybe even city? that you've kind of been to that that was that really surprised you well definitely bangladesh i've talked a lot about bangladesh because i've had yeah 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 um i have some other countries I, i've been wanting to go to and plan to go to this year but we're a bit more exotic but um it, it didn't work out with the virus but maybe next year yeah i think yeah, things are definitely a lot more tough with the with the virus and i heard that airbnb they're you know they were i think last quarter two quarters ago they were supposed to have an ipo and they're supposed to like make a lot of money in their IPO. But now with this whole coronavirus, uh, they're just going downhill and it's kind of scary. And that, I think that's why their Airbnb prices are going down too. Not cheap. Yeah, people are discounting a lot because a lot of people like, they, it's like an income property. They expect for rental income to pay their mortgage. So when that rental income doesn't come, they can't pay their mortgage. Um, and then they're going to lose the place. So we're just like, a lot of places will even like lose money. They'll put the rent under their mortgage just to like, be able to pay it, you know, just get something towards it. Yeah. Because I was talking with this guy and he told me that he was literally traveling across the country, renting like Airbnbs because it's so cheap and it's so affordable now, you know? Yeah. He said, it's, it's not, it's, it's not been the thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I wonder what's going to happen with Airbnb. Uh, I don't know if they're going to go bankrupt, but um, yeah, it's definitely a, a scary situation, but I think anyone who wants to travel, even though it's really tough, it could be one of the best opportunities if you, uh, if you can manage it. Yeah, it depends where you want to go. I mean, you have to have, you have, to have disposable income now. I've lost thousands of dollars on flights that I'm never going to get back because cancellation. So if you want to travel right now, you should have some disposable income because you're going to lose money on flights and you're not going to get it back. And you need to be okay with that. So if you want to travel right now, you should be okay with like, if a flight would normally be a 500, expect it to be, a thousand and expect to have to book it two to three times to actually get the flight. Like yeah. it is a lot cheaper technically, but also it's going to be so hard to travel with flights, but you should have like a dis- pretty good disposable budget to mm-hmm. go right now. Like maybe like in the United States is cheaper. If you want to go like Mexico is open for Americans, but like, yeah, I mean, even though th- things are discounted because it's so hard for like people to go there. So there's so yeah. few people. Wait, you said that you were 18 once you left the country, right? When, yeah. Right? Okay. I feel anyone who's like listening and they want to be like digital nomads, um, either they're 18 and their mid twenties, I feel that if they go to a different country, it's going to be a fun experience. But once they get there, they might be extremely anxious. They're gonna be, they might ask themselves like, what the heck am I doing here? This is such a bad idea. Um, did you kind of have those, did you have those feelings? Or do were um, you like, did you feel like financially safe to do whatever? And you just kind of had a safety net because you weren't in college yet, uh, right? You had that safety net. Like if you wanted to, you could go back to college. Yeah. So I, I never really felt too worried, but that's just my personality. But if people are like anxious, like the thing is, there's a Facebook group for like expats in every country and every city. Like there's the Bangkok expat freelancers Facebook group, you know, like you can easily meet people before you go. So if you're like, anxious to meet people you can do that or if you're worried about being able to afford it they have programs like one is called work away um work away is a program where you can volunteer for different charities and organizations and they provide you a free food and free rent and you have to volunteer generally four hours a day monday to friday so like if you were wanting to do a digital nomad lifestyle and you decided to add three or four thousand dollars only um budget for your plane ticket and then go do volunteering and you can get free food, free accommodation on your free time, build your business without really any risk. So there's a lot of cool options. I mean, and you don't ever really have to worry about being lonely. I know like some people are worried about being lonely. Um, it's honestly so easy to meet people in most typical countries for travel. Like, I mean, if you go to some more exotic ones, it'll be difficult, but like your Thailand or Indonesia, Malaysia, like the most popular countries to go to for digital nomads, there's so many expats to meet. And most of them also, you know, they want to make friends because they're away from home as well. So yeah. it's a pretty cool community. So whenever you went to a new country, you kind of, you know, went to a Facebook group and looked up if there are any communities and just met with those expats. Yeah, I did that sometimes, but also other times I just kind of enjoyed being alone too. Like 
um, like for example, in the, when um, quarantine was like full lockdown in Thailand, I spent two months in a bungalow on the beach, like talking to like hardly anybody. And I personally like that, but it just like matched my personality as well. Cause I don't mind being alone for extended periods of time. Um, I think it's kind of nice to like, just like focus on business and like yourself and uh, just relax. And quarantine was like a cool way to do that. Cause I managed to get like a really good deal on the water and just like hung out on the beach for two months. I definitely feel that when you're by yourself, you know, um, and it's much easier, it's much easier if you're like an introvert. Um, I'm, sp- I'm, I'm an introvert too. And when I spend a lot of time by myself, um, some people might say it's unhealthy, but you get to really as, cliche as it sounds you really get to know yourself and you're really at peace you know um you have a clear mind and you can just focus on you you know there's no real other person you have to worry about you just focus on yourself for your work and you can get a lot done at the end of the day yeah definitely that was one of my more productive periods of life because what are you going to do you can't do anything like the restaurants are closed the shops are closed um yeah and have you met like a lot of like interesting people along the way? Yeah, I've met a whole range of people. You know, the majority of digital nomads aren't extremely entrepreneurial. They're like freelancers, um, freelancers, people working remote jobs. But I've also met people who are making like ridiculous amounts of money living in Thailand. Like I met one guy in Thailand who started his company at 14, sold it at 16, and retired at 18. And he's been living in Thailand and traveling around Asia since then. Like, there's a there's a whole mix of people you know you have people who are just starting people who are just working a job people who have retired already like it's a whole mix of people and what's kind of like the demographic is it literally people from like 14 16 18 all the way to like 40 year olds or is it mainly because when i think about digital nomad style i always have the picture of like people in their mid-20s all together i think the stereotypical picture of a digital nomad is like a 25 year old scrawny white guy with a man bun holding a laptop. Like that's like what I think. And quite honestly, that's not incorrect. Um, yeah, it's mainly like dudes in their mid twenties, but there's also a lot of older people, like people who have retired, like they worked in corporate and now they just do like some consulting and they just want to like relax. Like you see a lot of like old dudes too, especially in Thailand, a lot of old dudes. Mm-hmm. Something that I've learned when I went to Thailand and I'm pretty sure it can be said in all other Asian countries is that um, always negotiate for everything, right? Even down to like the apartment from what I've heard. Now, when you go to new countries in Asia specifically, how do you find an apartment? Airbnb. Yeah, Airbnb. Airbnb. Oh, that's, everything's Airbnb. But if, okay, yeah. even, okay. I was going to say, if you want to like stay or maybe get a lease, uh, yeah. Airbnb has apartment. monthly discounts, but it's something they have, it's a bit newer. So like, a normal, even like non during, not during the pandemic, like you can get like a 30 to 40%, sometimes a monthly discount, which uh, isn't too bad. So I, I mainly use Airbnb. Um, sometimes like what I'll do is if I want to meet people, I'll stay at a hostel for like one or two days just to meet a bunch of people. Uh, but normally just Airbnb, it's, it's the easiest way to do it. And is there uh, like a time limit as to how many days, weeks you can stay at an Airbnb? No, you can stay for the whole year if you want to, as long as you're paying. Damn. That's actually, I, did, I didn't know that. I always thought that Airbnb had to stay like, okay, like maybe at most a month, but who cares if you're paying for the whole year, then it's happening. Yeah, we're okay. But yeah. They yeah. prefer that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And have you driven like, like motorcycles across like the, the country? Um, I haven't. I, um, I have, I rented a motorbike in Phuket, Thailand and Chiang Mai, Thailand. That was my first time riding a motorbike. And I would say it was very easy to learn because like the streets were empty because like Phuket is like 75% tourist. So you leave with 25% of Thai people and the roads are like empty. So it was really easy to learn there. Um, but like in Bangkok, I'm not brave enough to drive. In India and Bangladesh, I'm too smart to drive. Um, in some other places, I just, it's too expensive to rent. Like in Europe, you know, it's too expensive to rent a car. Yeah, when, when, I, when I was in, uh, what is it, Chiang Mai, uh, you know, everything in Asia, you have to drive on the left lane, not the right lane. And for a good yeah. amount of time, I was on the, on the right lane. I was like, oh, snap, this is not America. I got to go on the left lane. Um, It'll throw you off. Like, when I go home, I'm still used to the left lane now, but I don't have to relearn the light, right lane. Yeah. How is that, though? Like when you go back and you see everything kind of normal, not as chaotic, uh, 
does it feel like, oh, now I'm relaxed. I'm in a kind of calm sort of country or do you kind of feel like nostalgic? Oh, I can't wait to go back. Um, a bit nostalgic. Like I get, I don't know. Like I go from like having a very, like, I don't know. It's like, even though I've been here for quite a while in Thailand, it's still like new and different and exciting. Like looking out the window is like fun. Um, but when I go back home, sometimes I get like, not bored, but like, I just miss the excitement. So I try when I go back to like, it's very easy to stay at home when I go home. So even though I have a home here, it's not like my home, it's just a place I'm staying. But when I go back home, it's very easy to just like stay in my house, spend time with my family. Nothing's wrong with that, I wanna do that. But it's, uh, I try to like push myself to go out and like do things like, you know, just go to the city next like uh, 30 minutes away and explore a bit or like just can I get, I don't know. I don't like being complacent. Uh, I like new things. So yeah, when I go home, I get anxious to go to the next place. Mm-hmm. Do you kind of have a checklist of things that you want to do a bucket list? Um, I don't really have a bucket list, but my biggest goal in terms of travels, I'd like to go to every country before I die. All 192 UN countries. Do you have like one of those maps where you kind of scratch up every country that you've been to? I don't, but I have a giant map of the world on my wall and I have like to look at the countries and I have an app on my phone, but like crosses up the countries. Cause like, um, it's kind of confusing. Cause like, depending who you ask, there's like anywhere between 180 to like 300 countries. So I had to like, it honestly took me like 15 hours of research to figure out which list I was going to follow. And I finally decided on the United Nations country list. So like I have an app that tracks all the United Nations countries. And I've been to 20 United Nations countries. But if you add in like, they call them the FIFA countries. Like, like for example, like Taiwan, it's not a country, but it's a country. Hong Kong, it's not a country, but it's a country. Like Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, for example. If you count those, I'm at like 28 right now. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think, like, which city was one of the most advanced? Like, of course, I haven't traveled, but when I watch YouTube videos, I feel like Singapore or when you Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Tokyo, Singapore. Like, Tokyo, like, I see, these, I see what they have there. Um, it's like, what the heck? I think, I forgot which country. No, actually, no, it was in Shenzhen where I saw, mm-hmm. like, these buildings. All of them were lit with LEDs. I'm like, whoa, this looks something from, like, you know, um, a futuristic movie. Like, it's crazy what they have over there. I would say Singapore. Singapore is really advanced. Singapore is really advanced. Um, yeah, Singapore is like so perfect, but it almost feels like creepy. I don't know a better way to put it. Like, like everything is perfect. Yes. Yeah. But like in what sense, like uh, everything's too good to be true? Is that like like the streets sense? are perfectly clean? People are very proper. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a weird place. So even though it was like really beautiful, very kind of futuristic. It kind felt of just like too feeling. perfect, like kind of fake. Really? I'm pretty yeah, sure I if mean, you go to like in the outskirts of like Singapore, you probably find that excitement that you probably find in, in other cities in, in Asia. Maybe. I mean, Singapore is weird though, because like Singapore is the only country, but it's also a city. Like it's just Singapore. Like Singapore is the country, is the city. So there's not really too much outside it. Um, and it's so heavily regulated. Like Singapore is like the only place like Singapore, I think. Wait, what's the name of those buildings? It's kind of like there's three buildings, but they're connected uh, by like this weird boat looking thing. I know what you're talking about, but I, I'm i actually Googling it right now. What is it called? The Mariana Bay Sands. Yeah. Have you been to that? I haven't been up on them, but I've seen it. Oh, damn. I can only imagine. I think they have that, an infinity pool up there, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit fancy for me, but yeah, it'd be really cool. Yeah. And okay, what was like the best meal from every country you've been to, out of all the food that you've tasted, what was that one meal where you're like, damn? Um, Indian food is my favorite, but I don't like Indian food in India because it's terrifying. I had like food poisoning so bad I was in the hospital. So like when I eat in India and Bangladesh, I like the food, but I'm so nervous to eat it. But I don't enjoy it. So my favorite food is Indian food in Thailand. I have because <laughs> yeah, it's, cl- it's like close enough to like proper Indian food, but also you don't have to worry about dying from food poisoning because in Thailand, I know you got sick, but that's actually not too common in Thailand compared to some other places. Um, so like Indian food in Thailand is my favorite, I would say. Mm-hmm. So for the locals in, you know, in these countries, 
they don't get food poisoning. Is it because they're just so used to the water system that, you know? Yeah, I mean, they're used to the water, they're used to the food. Like, it depends where you are. Like, for example, in India and Bangladesh and a few other places, like, I brush my teeth with bottled water, I wash my face with bottled water, or um, I drink bottled water. Like, in Thailand, um, I brush my teeth with tap water, but I drink bottled water. So depending on the country, it, it's going to take different precautions. But people who are have been here, living here, you know, their, their stomachs are a lot tougher. <laughs> like, you could take, take an Indian and bring him to the United States, and they could eat literally everything in the entire <laughs> United States and, like, feel nothing. Yeah. Like, they have iron stomachs. Are you, are you good with spicy food? No, I don't like no. it. No. I remember no. when, I, when I went to Thailand, and so there's little red little things in, on, in the rice, and it packed a bunch of the, the, the Thai chili peppers. And I made sure. Don't kill you. Yeah. I just tough. made sure. Like, I, I, I couldn't handle it. It was like, it, it was at that point where I was scared to eat it because my, I thought that my, I would, I would lose my senses. I kind of panicked. I'm not going to lie. But yeah, the food there was crazy good. I, I remember, I, I'm always going to, like, I'm never going to forget this. Literally, the first meal I got, um, I forgot where in Bangkok. But it was by the, this red, this giant uh, red swing by Khao Sao Road. I, 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 mm -hmm. I think I'm butchering the name. Um, yeah, Khao Sao. Khao Sao Road. Yeah, maybe it was like a 10 minute walk from where I was staying. I was staying at a hostel. And literally the first meal I got, um, I forgot what the name of it was, but it was kind of like a soup and had a bunch of spices and, and chicken, right? Uh, like fried chicken inside. That was my first meal and my last meal because that was literally the best thing I ever tasted in my life. And, and even then, uh, when I went to different restaurants in Thailand, they did have a lot of Indian food, a bunch of like Indian curries. I didn't even know that, that they existed. Like the wealth of like food that they have in Thailand is just amazing. The, the street, the market, my favorite thing was like the markets that they had there, you know, and just negotiating. Uh, I was so embarrassed to negotiate, but literally – you know, they'll rip you off if you just buy uh, the regular price. So you kind of have to learn. If not, you'll get ripped off. Yeah, it's it's fun. Like right now, negotiating is so easy. They they say a price. You just respond back with your offer. And when then they when they like reply back to you, you just ignore them. And they'll say yes because they need the business, which is <laughs> yeah. kind of sad. It's like almost oh, cheating. Yeah. Like but tuk-tuk drivers, for example, will be like, you know, 200. And I'll say 75. And they'll say, you know, 150. And I just shake my head no and they'll say fine which is like it's kind of like i'm finally able to take advantage of them because they've been taking advantage of the tourists for so long like now oh, yeah. you need the money to eat and you're done ripping off tourists yeah i mean you have that experience across so many countries and you know you're not going to get played again i'm pretty sure you got played a couple times well right now they don't have anybody to like rip off so they're desperate like there's yeah. no tourists here so they they're like very the people who are used to like the, like not everybody rips people off, but like, especially the people who are ripping people off, like in Kalsan where the tourists are, like, it's so nice to like have the upper hand against them now when it comes to oh, negotiating. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's important to be confident in that respect. I mean, a lot of people might think, oh, uh, in the U S we don't do that, but it's just a different dynamic. And, uh, even me, like being in the U S my whole life, having some experience in Thailand and, and Colombia, um, it kind of puts things into perspective where you got to explore new things. And just, this is another world out there, literally. Um, and possibly like another cool opportunity, you know, U S isn't the only country where you can create a business. You know, this new lifestyle sure. of being a digital nomad is real. You know, you can still earn U S dollars while um, living in another beautiful country. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. It's, I feel, how many years do you think this lifestyle has been, kind of glorified i mean it's been trendy for like five years now like airbnb uber like youtube has made like this all so much easier but there's guys who've been doing this forever like i've met guys who've been traveling around thailand for like 20 30 years i mean it's just that it's become more accessible and more mainstream um because before you know it was, wasn't common to work abroad we're now like especially now after the virus like People who used to work nine to five desk jobs now have remote nine to five jobs. So they're figuring, you know, maybe those people will start traveling more after too. So it's just become, it's not become more, more common, but yeah, I think it's just going to continue to become even more common as 
as when things back open back up. Mm -hmm. If if you were to meet someone who wants to travel the country, uh, not only just to work, actually let's put it that way. If someone wants to work in a foreign country, be be a digital nomad, what are some like golden nuggets that you believe are kind of essential for any uh, digital nomad to know off the bat? When you're starting out, like Workaway, I mentioned that's like Workaway where you can volunteer for food and board. Like that is perfect because your basic spent will be food and rent. Um, so that will give you a nice opportunity to like make an impact locally and also like have free rent to work on your business. Um, I mean, it just depends on the business model. Like you can, you can do freelancing abroad. You can get a job abroad for me personally, you know, my marketing agency and a few other businesses support me. Um, but yeah, I would say people just starting the biggest like golden nugget would be work away. That site is amazing for people who want to be able to travel, but don't have the funds or they want to like be abroad while building their business. Okay. Yeah. Cause I never heard of that program before, but I think it serves as a good opportunity. You know, you don't always have to be an entrepreneur. If you're just one experience living in a different country, sure. I think it's cool, you know, get an opportunity for them to pay for food and, and housing. And you said you have to volunteer from, from eight to four or um, it's four just like four, hours? Hour, four okay. or five hours a day. It depends. It's almost like an Airbnb search engine. You literally go on Workaway's website and you look up, okay, what country, what state, what city, um, what are your skill sets? You can sort by reviews and people list their own Workaways on there. So it's like its own search engine. Uh, there's so many opportunities. You can like volunteer for whatever you want. Like, even though I don't need to, I still like really want to do one. And I found like one that looks really cool in Nicaragua um, that's helping build, um, helping at an orphanage that they have a skate park, like teach kids how to skateboard. Like I'm a skater. So like, I just think that sounds cool. So like, you can find like them based around your interests. If you like gardening, there's ones based around gardening. Um, if you like helping kids with special needs, they have programs based around helping kids with special needs. So like, it's a really cool platform. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I never heard of that. And I think, wow. Going to Nicaragua would be definitely that's intentional America, right? So is that like, would that be like a new part of the of the country that you'll go to if you were ever to do that? Going to Nicaragua? Yeah, I haven't really spent too much time in South America. Yeah, I definitely watch videos of some people in Colombia, Argentina. Um, so it's, it's, people, I think, I think there's a large demographic of U.S. citizens of U.S. people out living in Mexico too. Um, I think there's one city, I forgot the name of it, but supposedly there's a huge, huge population of, of Americans in that one part of Mexico, because it does have that um, kind of like organized chaos. It's chaotic freedom, sure. that's what they call it. Um, but yeah, oh, man, I can only imagine just traveling around the world. Like I, this reminds me of going back to Thailand and you know, <laughs> just seeing everything, it's like so much different. Do you think it's a good idea to save like maybe a couple thousand dollars in case your business doesn't go right? Kind of have this oh, yeah. safety net. I mean, you should, you should have enough money to, you should, yeah, you should, I, I, I wouldn't, I would say you should have like at least 5k. That way you could always get like a flight back home and have enough money for rent for a few months. I mean, I, I don't think it's smart to come here and um, just like in the United States, we don't want people coming to the United States with no money, but they run out of money and, take our government funds like we don't want that so you shouldn't do that here like some yeah. people come here with no money and then you know they run out of money and they literally like it's kind of pathetic they call it bag packers broke backpackers who like go travel and then they run out of money like suck up government funds and like beg for money like it's pathetic like you should at least have enough money to get there and back before going yeah so if you have like a one-way trip make sure you have enough to go yeah. back if everything goes wrong I mean, for, for, for Americans and like Europeans, like come with no money and then end up begging for money in a country where people like make them much less than the countries they come from. It's just like the, to me, it's just like, you're such a pathetic creature. Like, just don't do that. I, I think I read an article on, on that and it is sad, you know, you just making American dollars and having it converted. Like you should know just winging it in a different country or foreign country is just a lot more scarier. Um, I don't know. I, I sometimes think about like being like locked up abroad. Um, that's one of the mm -hmm. other things that kind of like, you have to make sure you really follow the guidelines and the rules of each particular or country. Or bribe money, depending oh, yeah. where you are. Oh, true. You get out of true. a lot of stuff. Yeah. But I think it's like still, 
there's some like taboo, some things that you may think that's normal uh, here in the United States, sure. but once you do it in the, some different country, it's kind of like, like, what the heck are you doing, dude? You know? Yeah, cultural differences. Yeah, so I think those, in, in terms of that aspect, it is important to know. Um, did you ever have the will or, you know, of learning a different language? Um, I have learned some Spanish just for fun. Uh, but quite honestly, like learning a language as an English speaker would literally only be for fun or if you need it for business. Like people speak enough English everywhere, but like it's unnecessary. I, if I learn a language, it would literally just be for fun. Um, and I do want to learn some more Spanish. So I, I'm thinking about traveling South America next year, maybe learning some Spanish there. Yeah, I think one of the best ways of learning a language is living in that country and kind of, you know, being forced to speak the language and, and learn it. Yeah, cultural immersion. Yeah, because in, in South America, at least in Colombia, when I go, um, not everyone speaks English, you know, at least compared to you go to Thailand, where it's kind of like a second sure. language, you know. But yeah, Michael, I don't want to take too much of your time. I think it's really awesome. You're actually the first digital nomad that I've ever spoken on the show. Oh, great. And it just it brings a different perspective. Uh, everyone I, I've been talking to are like investors, drop shippers, um, and things alike. But just having someone on the show that, oh, you can actually go to another country, make, make money, and explore the world. It's a different dynamic. You know, you don't always have to live the lavish lifestyle in the U.S., you can yeah. live that exam sex lifestyle, if not even better, in a different country while pursuing your entrepreneurial uh, ventures. I I agree. Well, I appreciate you having me on your having me on your show. For sure, man. So where can people hit you up? Where can they find you if they if they want to check you out? Sure. So on Instagram and TikTok, it's Michael M I C H A L R Gardener G A R D I N E R. And my agency website is nomadswithsolutions.com. And if you want to check out my personal website that has information about all my businesses, travel, just more about me, it's Michael R. Gardner, and that's G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R.com. Got it. And you said that you're going to be heading back to New York to go back to your home in Florida soon, right? Yeah, I fly, I fly back home next week, so not long. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hopefully you have a, a safe trip, man. I really appreciate you being on the show. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right.